Okay. Welcome, everyone, to this, our 64th episode of the Clements Bookworm. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library, and happy to spend this Friday morning with you. Um, just as a note, we are recording today, so you will receive an email with the resources mentioned during today's broadcast, as well as the link to the recording. And um, in case you haven't joined us before, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of how we use Zoom. We like to use the chat function. My colleague, Helen Harding, will be monitoring the chat and responding um, to any information there, as well as providing helpful links. And we encourage you to chime in and change the setting to everyone. Uh, we like to keep the conversation going. But if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A section so that we can keep all of the questions together for the panelists. And then you can also see the questions that other people are asking. And if you give it a thumbs up, it will upvote it so that we can see what the most um, requested questions are. We also have live machine captioning turned on. So you can turn that, toggle that on or off or uh, change the size of the text. And I can only control so much of what you see, but I do have side-by-side -side mode enabled. So in theory, you should be able to change the relative size of the slides and the presenters. So play around with your screen so that you can get comfortable. This program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library, located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library's mission is to collect, preserve, share, and promote the study and discussion of primary sources related to all aspects of history and culture of North America and the Caribbean to about 1900. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Michigan is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations made the largest single land donation to the University of Michigan, offered ceremonially as a gift in the text of the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids, so that their children could be educated in a Western manner. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed the University of Michigan to be founded. Today, we reaffirm contemporary and ancestral Anishinaabek ties to this land and their profound contributions to this institution. The William L. Clements Library also acknowledges that it has and continues to benefit from the original land dispossession and established hierarchies of settler colonialism. Okay, if you haven't clicked your answer on the poll question yet, do it very, very quickly. I'm going to pull that up and end the poll and share the results. All right, so our question was, how many Black students were enrolled in the University of Michigan Medical School in 1864? And so you're going to hear more about this answer today. Um, and the answer is two. Thank you so much to Jim and Linda Wilson who have generously sponsored today's episode of The Bookworm. We appreciate uh, there and all of your participation in the bookworm and for making this a really wonderful community to spend um, a Friday morning with. During the month of February, we celebrate Black History Month. Each year, the multi-ethnic student affairs department and student organizations create a wide range of events to honor, and recognize the achievements, contributions, and rich cultural heritage of Black individuals and communities throughout history. To learn more about these events, please take a moment to visit the MESA website link in the chat. So for today's program, our manuscripts curator, Cheney Chopere, will engage in a discussion with author Jill Newmark. 
Cheney began working in the Manuscripts Division of the Clements Library in 2002. He obtained his MSI degree from the University of Michigan School of Information in 2009 with a specialization in archives and records management and became the Clements Assistant Curator of Manuscripts in 2009 and the Curator of Manuscripts in 2013. And I'm delighted to uh, turn it over to him now. Great. Thank you, Angela. And good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jill Newmark. Um, Ms. Newmark is an independent historian and was formerly a curator and exhibition specialist at the National Library of Medicine, um, uh, the National Institutes of Health. Her exhibits included Binding Wounds, Pushing Boundaries, African Americans and Civil War Medicine, and within these walls, Contraband Hospital and the African Americans who served there, as well as Opening Doors, Contemporary African American uh, Academic Surgeons. Um, she's published articles in Prologue and Traces, as well as online and Circulating Now and BlackPast.org. Um, today, um, Jill Newmark will be discussing her recent book, uh, Without Concealment, Without Compromise, The Courageous Lives of Black Civil War Surgeons, published by Southern U Illinois University Press, which explores the lives of the 14 currently known African-American surgeons who served in the Union Army during the war. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Jill Newmark. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Just have to move something out of the way so I can see. Um, thank you, Cheney and um, Angela and everyone at the University of Michigan and Clements Library for the opportunity to speak to you uh, about my new book and about the um, black medical students that went on to become surgeons that uh, attended the University of Michigan. Okay. In 1863, the United States Colored Troops was established, recruiting nearly 200,000 black men to serve in the Union Army during the American Civil War. Among them were 14 black surgeons who courageously served their country, tending to the sick and wounded. The accounts of these men go beyond the obvious merits of their military service, to their influence and impact on their communities, their race, and their country. Their ambition to become physicians and contribute to the fight for emancipation and equality were not deterred by society's prejudicial dictates. Their dignified acts of resistance and pioneering new pathways challenged the status quo. They became catalysts of change and symbols of an emancipated future. In my recently published book, Without Concealment, Without Compromise, The Courageous Lives of Black Civil War Surgeons, the stories of John H. Rapier Jr. and Alpheus W. Tucker, both who attended the University of Michigan Medical School, are told using many resources from the Clements Library 
And this presentation will feature these two surgeons and the stories of their lives and military service. Um, in 1860, the enslaved population in the United States was nearly 4 million, and the country would soon be entrenched in a civil war fighting to unite itself and to end slavery. Um, after the attack on Fort Sumter in April 1861 that launched the Civil War, many were anxious to fight for the U.S., including black men, both enslaved and free, who were ready to take up arms. They believed that by joining the U.S. Army, they would demonstrate their right to citizenship and their patriotism. Among them were 14 black physicians who were dedicated to the fight for freedom. They were committed to using their medical skills in support of emancipation and in service to the thousands and thousands of black soldiers and civilians during the war. Many of these men had been activists and advocates for social and political change prior to the war. Um, some of them participated in the anti-slavery movement and actively promoted education and advancement for African-Americans. And when they became military surgeons, they were able to move their activism into a larger theater where they could use their newly acquired positions as military officers to advocate for change and to support fellow black soldiers and formerly enslaved people. Now, just to give you a little framework, um, I want to just review some basics about Civil War surgeons. Surgeons that served during the Union, uh, served the Union Army were either commissioned military officers or they were private physicians who entered into a contract with the Army as acting assistant surgeons. Surgeons were generally uh, ranked as majors, while assistant surgeons were captains or lieutenants. Most regiments were required to have medical personnel that included at least one surgeon, two assistant surgeons, uh, along with the full contingent of enlisted men. And by the end of the war, there were over 12,000 surgeons that had served in the Union Army, then treated more than 400,000 wounded and sick soldiers. Of those 12,000, we know of only 14 that were um, African-American. At the start of the war, uh, President Lincoln called for volunteers to join the fight for the Union, and there were many African-Americans that were eager to join, but they were restricted in their participation because of their color. But as the war lingered on, the military resources for both the Union and Confederate troops were strained and dwindling, and the enlistment of black soldiers was inevitable. In 1863, after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed slaves in the, um, in the uh, re re rebellion states only, the Union began to recruit and enlist black men, and they established the United States Colored Troops. Um, as many African Americans really sought a role to play, they sought, a play, they sought to play an active role in the war and in the fight for freedom. As I mentioned, some black physicians were also determined to serve. And we, as I mentioned, we only know of 14 of the 12,000 surgeons that served during the war. Two of them received military commissions while the remaining were on contract as acting assistant surgeons. Now, since white surgeons and officers would not serve along black surgeons in the field or be subordinate to a black man, African-American surgeons were most often assigned to military-run hospitals or recruiting stations for black soldiers. And this included contraband and freedmen's hospitals in Washington, D.C., Arlington, Virginia, and Savannah, Georgia, as well as recruiting stations in Baltimore, Indianapolis, and Hilton Head, South Carolina, where they basically examined black recruits. The appointment of black surgeons was based primarily on race. The federal records that document work assignments of these surgeons indicate duty stations at facilities that only treated African-Americans. There were no black surgeons assigned to white hospitals. And as you can see here, the assignment was Freedman's Hospital Contraband uh, Recruiting Rendezvous. This, um, uh, it's interesting to note that at uh, Confederate hospitals, Although we know that there were no black surgeons, the majority of the nurses that served were black and enslaved. Uh, Chimborazo Hospital in Richmond, Virginia was the largest Confederate hospital and 95% of the nurses, the individuals listed as nurses were black 
They were black men and most of them were enslaved. John H. Rapier and Alphaeus Tucker were among the 14 men who served as surgeons during the war and both of them attended the medical school at the University of Michigan. <clears throat> and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them. I must tell you, colored men in the US uniform are much respected here in visiting the various departments. If the class is that of an officer, you receive the military salute from the ground as promptly as if your blood was a Howard or Pen Plantagenet instead of a puff Pumpy or a Cuffy. These are the words of John H. Rapier Jr who served as an acting assistant surgeon at Contraband Hospital in Washington, DC. And Contraband Hospital was taken over by the Freedmen's Bureau. So I use that interchangeably. It's Contraband and Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, DC are basically the same hospital. Uh, John Rapier Jr. was a man of adventure and ambition with a appetite for knowledge and a sense of duty, compassion, and humor. Much of what we learn about his life and his desires comes from his personal writings, which are preserved along with correspondence from other family members at Howard University's Moreland Spingarn Research Center. Um, and it is unusual to have such a large number of personal letters from, um, from any of these black surgeons. Um, from these letters, we know that he filled his days with travel, politics, study, family, and service. His family roots and the examples that were set by his strong grandmother, his loving father, and his very successful uncle influenced and encouraged him in his pursuits. Their strength, perseverance, hard work, and commitment to attaining a free and better life really set an example for him of self-sufficiency and self-preservation that stayed with him as he navigated through his world. Um, John Rapier Jr. was freeborn in Florence, Alabama in 1835. His father was a very successful barber in Florence, and they lived a fairly comfortable life. Um, the profession of a barber for a black man was considered a very good job with a, a fairly decent income. His mother, Susan, died in childbirth when John was only six years old, and it was a very devastating loss for him as a young boy. After his mother's death, uh, he was sent along with his younger brother, James, to live with his grandmother, Sally Thomas, and his uncle, James, who was only eight years older than John, uh, and they lived in Nashville, Tennessee. Sally was enslaved and, oops, excuse me, one too many slides. Uh, Sally was enslaved and she ran her own successful laundry business in uh, Nashville. Um, John was a very precocious child and he had a, um, a strong interest in learning and he was known to eagerly devour whatever books he could get a hold of. Now his, his grandmother Sally was enslaved, but there were some opportunities um, for enslaved persons to run their own business and make some of their own money, though some money did go to their enslaver. And this is what uh, Sally um, had this business and her prime motivation was to gather up enough money to find ways to have her sons gain their freedom. Um, John received his early education in a school in Nashville and he remained there until his grandmother's death in 1850. He returned home for a time then but then he moved to Buffalo where he lived with his uncle Henry. Um, but they soon relocated to Canada after the enactment of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850, which basically allowed any white person to claim ownership of any black person, free or presumed a fugitive slave, uh, based solely on what the white person's claim of ownership was. And he continued his education as a young man in Buxton, Canada at the Buxton Mission School. Um, he studied there alongside Anderson R. Abbott, who would also go on to serve as a surgeon during the Civil War. Now, they settled in Buxton, where John was able to continue his education. Um, and Buxton was a predominantly black community that had been established by a white minister 
to offer social and economic opportunities to black people and to really provide a safe haven for the formerly enslaved, um, especially those who had crossed the border from the US into Canada. He studied in Buxton for a few years. And then after he finished school there, he went back to Florence, Alabama. Uh, he kept up with current affairs and kept his pulse on the, uh, the, the activities of the country. But he was really longing for a better life and was very disenchanted with the conditions of black people in the United States. This grew his desire to find a better place where black people could live and work in a welcoming environment. And this desire was an incentive for him to travel with his uncle James to Central America in 1855, and then again to Haiti and Jamaica in the West Indies in the early 1860s. Now, while he was in Jamaica, he studied dentistry with a local Canadian dentist. And he was fairly happy being a dentist, but he was an ambitious man, and he believed that becoming a doctor would be a more prestigious and lucrative career. So he began studying medicine with a local physician there. Um, and after studying with him for several years, um, it, it maybe for a, a, a year or so, the physician had suggested that um, Rapier was now ready and able to gain entrance to a medical school. Um, and he was mentioning a medical school in Canada. Um, so during this time, Rapier kept abreast of all the news from home, uh, from the occasional newspaper that came from New York. So by the time the war began in 1861, he was very well aware of the situation back home. His thoughts were with his family in Alabama and how he might best be able to help support them. And this included his father. His father had remarried, so that included his stepmother and his younger siblings. Now, his father was a free man, but his stepmother was enslaved, and his younger um, half-siblings were also considered enslaved at that time. In a letter that he wrote to his uncle James from, uh, the, from Jamaica, he said, I am ill at ease when I remember that, <clears throat> excuse me, everything that I hold dear in the world and without whose presence I would not care to live are surrounded by dangers and probably destruction. Despite the distance that he was from his family, he was really determined to provide whatever assistance he could. As a physician, he knew that his salary would be much more than a dentist, and he would be able to support himself and his family. He told his uncle, the surest and the cheapest way to do this is to educate me for the duties and responsibilities of teacher and guardian to this large family. Now, if I graduate as physician, as I sure will, I shall, by my social and cultivated position, be able to assume these responsibilities, which will be an act of humanity and justice to them, and honor and pleasure to myself. So in May 1862, Rapier headed home. And uh, by the time he left Jamaica for America in 1862, as you can see here, he was listed as a dentist on the passenger list. Um, he, he considered himself a dentist and, and um, he traveled back to the U.S. on the SS Dolphin. Once he arrived back, he enrolled in Oberlin College in Ohio. Uh, he was 27 years old. And this is kind of where the paths of both Rapier and Tucker kind of first intersect. Um, so Alpheus Tucker was freeborn in Detroit, Michigan in 1844. His father was a barber and supported the abolitionist activities in the city. Although it's not clear where Alpheus received his early education, it's safe to assume that he was well-educated from his later successes in college and in medical school. His parents were also likely well-read as two of their children were named after figures in Greek mythology, Alpheus, the river god, and Cepheus, a king of Ethiopia. At the age of 17, Tucker entered Oberlin College. And this is uh, one of the Greek gods here. It's not clear whether Rapier and Tucker knew each other or knew about each other at Oberlin, although they attended at the same time during 1863, as you can see here. Uh, Tucker was listed from Toledo, Ohio, 
and rapier was listed as being from Kingston, Jamaica. Um, generally, they asked, generally, it, it, these listings said, where was your last residence? Um, but um, John Rapier decided to identify himself as from Kingston, Jamaica. In July of 1863, he left Oberlin to enroll in uh, the University of Michigan Medical School, where he again identified himself as a man from Jamaica, as he had done so at Oberlin. Tucker, who graduated from Oberlin in 1863, decided to also pursue medicine at the University of Michigan after he learned that, quote, a colored gentleman from the West Indies had been admitted to the med department. Uh, Rapier had been in, in attendance at the school for about three months when Tucker arrived. <clears throat> Once again, their paths intersected, but their experiences were quite different. When Tucker enrolled, he paid the matriculation fee without, quote, the slightest objection. But when he showed up on the first day of classes, he was summarily rejected by his fellow white students. The faculty acquiesced to the protestations of the white students, and they asked Tucker to leave the school. Um, as discovered and noted by Cheney here, uh, the curator of manuscripts at Clements Library, Tucker's name was erased from the medical student registry for 1863 and replaced with the names of James F. McCarroll for entry number 296. Uh, Cheney also made note that the abraded paper and the darker ink of McCarroll's name is fairly good evidence that Tucker's name was erased and uh, McCarroll's name was added. Um, John Rapier wrote an account of Tucker's incident in a letter to his cousin um, in November 1863. He told her, the university has been thrown into convulsions during the past 10 days because an African, um, an American of African descent dared to present himself as a candidate for admission to the medical class. He was permitted to matriculate by the officer in charge of the department. But when the gentleman showed himself in the lecture, it was a signal for commotion among the copperheads and many unprincipled Republicans. The faculty willing, willingly pan, uh, willing to pander to this prejudice invited Mr. Tucker to leave the university. He did so after receiving his fees back. So you see, colored men are not admitted here. Um, Tucker responded to the actions of the university in a letter to the editor of the Detroit Advertiser and Tribune, um, and that was published in March 20, uh, 23, 1864 in the issue of the True De uh, Democrat. Tucker questioned the validity of the faculty's decision. He said, I would like to know if there be any law in the state university to prevent my attendance. I was told that the students objected to sit under the same roof with me. Why did, not, that, why did they not object to riding in the same cars with me on my way to Ann Arbor? Supposing that some of the students did object, have they a right to control the university in such matters? Tucker believed that the number of students that objected to his presence was smaller than the school claimed and that the faculty were really to blame for his forced departure because of their own racist attitudes. He said, a Negro hating faculty will soon make Negro hating students. Tucker made it very clear that he would not be deterred by the treatment he received, which he said was, quote, more suited to an uneducated than an educated community. Your treatment of me will not prevent my continuance of my medical education elsewhere. So um, Tucker's rescinded admission to the University of Michigan led him to Keokuk Medical College in Keokuk, Iowa in 1864, where he attended lectures and he received his early medical degree in early 1865. Uh, Rapier had also left the University of Michigan in February 1864 to continue his medical education at Keokuk Medical College, um, not because he was rejected by the students and the faculty, but it was a means for him to hasten his medical degree, which he said he could receive in June rather than waiting till early uh, 1865. Um, it's interesting to make note that here again, he identified himself as a man from Jamaica. Um, and 
it seems fairly clear that Tucker identifying himself as coming from Detroit and Rapier identifying himself as coming from Jamaica indicated that he was a man of color, but he was a foreigner. And therefore, I believe his treatment was um, different than that of um, Alpheus Tucker. Um, this was, again, here at Keokuk, this was the third time that John Rapier and Alpheus Tucker's path crossed. Uh, Rapier and Tucker both received medical degrees in 1864 and 1865, uh, respectfully. After graduation, they both sought positions as surgeons with the Union Army in order to jo join in the fight for freedom. And this is where their paths would cross for another, a fourth time. Both Rapier and uh, Tucker received contracts as acting assistant surgeons with the Union Army in June 1864 for uh, John Rapier in March 2nd, 1865 for Alpheus Tucker. And they were appointed to Freedman's Hospital in Washington, DC. Rapier had inquired on how to uh, gain a position in the army as a medical officer. And um, after his graduation, he had written a letter and said, I will graduate in June and would long beg of you the knowledge of the proper method of making an application. He explained that he had attended the University of Michigan and the University of Iowa. And here he said I, that he was a quadroon of Southern birth. Um, so here we see that um, uh, uh, John Rapier identified himself now as being born in the US uh, because he was applying for a position. So clearly he was very aware of how he self-identified and how that would affect how he was treated and how he was perceived. Um, although, you know, he did not get a regular position. He, as I mentioned before, he was hired on contract as an acting assistant surgeon and he was assigned to, um, to Friedman's Hospital. And as uh, here's his other letter where he says, it may be irrelevant to state that I am a quadroon of Southern birth. Um, Alpheus Tucker had applied for a position with the army in March, 1865. He passed his army medical board examination. And it's interesting to note here, as you can see, his uh, board examination was approved and, he, and, and his position uh, as an acting assistant surgeon was approved by Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who placed his signature on this letter here. Um, Tucker signed an oath of office on March 2nd, 1865, and he was signed to Freedman's Hospital. Um, he served there for six months and his salary was $100, which at the time seemed to be a fairly decent um, salary. Freedman's Hospital, um, was originally established as contraband hospital in Washington, D.C. by the Union Army in 1862, um, primarily to provide temporary housing, food, and medical care to the thousands of formerly enslaved men, women, and children that were coming um, into the Washington, D.C. area. It was a tented camp and hospital that became a center of contraband relief efforts during the war. And it was one of the very few hospitals to serve African-Americans in Washington, DC. What you see here on the left, um, uh, I see it on the left, is a diagram of the contraband camp. Um, after it, uh, it changed to Freedman's Hospital, it moved from this location to what was formerly Campbell Army Hospital, and it expanded it, which is why uh, there's this a lithograph of Campbell Army Hospital because it eventually became um, Freedman's Hospital. The hospital really primarily served the black civil, civilian population and it also tended to the wound, wounds and uh, the wounded and sick soldiers of the United States Colored Troop. On occasion, uh, white patients were treated in the smallpox ward and they were generally the relief workers or volunteers that were working at the hospital, but they were in segregated hospital tents. And you can see this diagram on the left-hand side, there's these little things that look like uh, squiggly marks. That's uh, the smallpox hospital uh, tented area. Um, the work at the hospital was very demanding. Um, long hours, 
And uh, John Rapier wrote a letter to his uncle James while he was working there. And he said, I never worked so hard and had so little rest and felt so tired at night as I do now. Um, John Rapier was really committed to providing the best possible care for his patients. A friend once remarked that through summer's heat and winter's cold, I have seen him wending his way among the homes of the lowly who needed his professional services. So he not only served the hospital, but he also served the community. Um, I, I'm going back to this because the uniform, uh, I want to mention the uniform of an army officer was really a symbol of rank and position. And for a black man, it represented a position of authority that had not previously been available to any person of color. Now, contract surgeons, even though they weren't in the official military, they received a rank as well as a uniform, similar to those as the commissioned officers. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Rapier was very unsure about wearing the uniform. Um, in a letter to his uncle, he wrote, I must tell you, colored men in the US uniform are much respected here. And I mentioned that. And he, he had decided not to wear the uniform. But he said, I have altered my mind, and I shall appear hereafter in full dress, gold lace, pointed hat, straps, and all. So Rapier clearly recognized how appearance affects the way one is perceived and the way one is treated while instilling a sense of pride in oneself. And really that speaks to his knowledge of self-representation and the politics of appearance. And while he was traveling in the Caribbean, he also made note in many of his letters the differences in complexion and how people were treated. So he was very well aware of that perception of how you're perceived by the way that you look. Um, he remained at Friedman's Hospital. He uh, did administrative work, treated patients. Um, and as I mentioned before, he went out into the community to provide medical services. But those long hours and the hard work took its toll on him. And in 1866, he fell ill with the bilious fever and he succumbed to his illness on May 17, 1866, at the age of only 33. Um, he was remembered by the Reunion Literary Club, of uh, which he was a member. And they said he was a gentle man of manly deportment, unexceptionable moral character, and literary attainments. And I would say that um, he was a prolific writer, wrote prose and poetry, and was very eloquent and sensitive in his writings. Um, and I talk about that in, in, uh, in my book a little bit more extensively. Alpheus Tucker uh, served at Friedman's Hospital for about six months. And after that, he remained in Washington. Uh, he got married. He established a medical practice there. Um, and he served the, the medical needs of the black community. He also was involved a little bit in the local politics. And in 1869, um, the, he, along with two fellow black surgeons, Alexander Augusta and Charles Purvis, um, really did a remarkable thing in the fight for equality within their own medical profession. They were seeking admission to the Medical Society of the District of Columbia. Now, that was the local medical organization that licensed physicians in Washington. And basically, through membership, it enabled them to attend meetings, to discuss medical cases, and to hold consultations with other physicians. Now, without this membership, Tucker, Augusta, and Purvis were unable to consult with other physicians on cases that put themselves and their patients at a disadvantage. And that's what they claimed. Um, though they were successful in gaining the support of the United States Congress, who determined that the Medical Society had discriminated against them by um, not allowing them to become members, there was no remedy was offered. And uh, they were de ultimately denied membership. They did have licenses to practice, but they were denied membership. So undeterred by the setback, they actually went on to establish um, the Integrated National Medical Society of the District of Columbia, and they were able to attend the American Medical Association meeting there, um, which was uh, part of what their goal was. In 1879, um, Tucker traveled back to Detroit to visit his family, and he spent some time in Canada. But while he was there, he contracted a cold, and he traveled back to Detroit and ultimately died of his illness and in 1880 at the age of 35. The impact of these surgeons uh, and the contributions they made during the war um, can still be felt today. 
Um, and I want to mention this in particular. Um, in 2009, the University of Michigan paid homage to one of these surgeons, Alpheus W. Tucker, by establishing a professorship in his name. The doc, Dr. Theodore Washnia, the first Alpheus W. Tucker, MD, collegiate professor of internal medicine, explained this. He explained the naming, that naming the professorship after Tucker recognizes, he said, quote, the university's history of racism and the faculty's complicitness in that racism. Naming a professorship in his honor seemed to me to be a way to apologize for that wrong and commit to doing better in the future. It is meant to remind us that our institution, as all institutions, is imperfect and that constant efforts to live up to our democratic ideals are necessary. Progress does not happen by some invisible force. It happens when people make the effort to fight for justice. And I believe this is what these 14 black surgeons did. 14 black men shared a desire to move beyond the boundaries of color that were created by a dominant white society to become medical doctors and surgeons and to achieve a better life for themselves and their communities. They were raised among well-educated free African-Americans who were committed to freedom, equality, and advancement and education. They were influenced and inspired by the accomplishments and successes of those around them. They navigated the world with a strong sense of identity and a belief in their ability to move beyond society's expectations. Their work as medical professions during the Civil War challenged the prescribed notions of race and they pushed the boundaries of the role of black people in America. They played a crucial role in the evolving definition of freedom, citizenship, and patriotism. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jill, uh, very much. And I've seen the comments about the volume. I'm going to speak at about this volume because it's about as loud as I can speak. So um, first, again, thank you, um, Jill, for the presentation and also for the book. Um, you know, um, you and I had first uh, connected back in 2016 in a conversation over um, the carte de visite photograph of Dr. Charles Purvis that's in a photograph album that we have, um, the photograph album that was presented to Theodore Weld, um, the husband of abolitionist and, um, and multifaceted reformer Angelina Grimke. And I remember, I remember at that time um, being very excited about your project because one of our donors, um, the late Dr. Dwayne Norman Diedrich, had given us um, several letters of a University of Michigan medical student named William Burns, um, two of which referred to his classmate, Alpheus Tucker. Um, so I, of course, went through the literature looking for biographical descriptions of this man and came up with um, fragments. Um, mm -hmm. And I found myself um, wanting a book that I could go to um, offering information and insight into the lives of African-American surgeons, including Dr. Tucker. Um, and in this particular, I was trying to get this photograph from my book to show. <laughs> oh, oh, with Purvis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and, and one of those issues, you know, and, and one of the reasons, you know, that, that I think that didn't already exist is that there are so few known surviving records that um, tell the stories of persons like um, Dr. Tucker um, or persons like um, Richard Henry Green, who's in, in the book. Um, I'm wondering if um, you could say a few words about tracking down and finding primary sources um, for this project. and. And then as an addendum, sort of what, like any additional uh, documents that you might have turned up since that you wish you would have had during the public <laughs> before it was actually printed? Yeah, it's quite, um, it's quite a journey when you're, when you're um, 
um, really doing research on a on a on a uh, on a subject that not too many people have done anything with. You have to. It's you find one little piece here, one little piece here, and you kind of sew them together to make a larger picture. And sometimes you just find one thing. I would go to the uh, National Archives, and I would. I wouldn't even, I, I would go through as many documents as I could, but I wouldn't sit there and read them. I would just take pictures of them because then I could go home and I could read them. And I would take three or 400 pictures every time I would go. Um, and um, it's, uh, it, it's always very challenging. I think you also have to think outside the box. And I'll give you a quick example, an anecdotal example, which is in my book. Um, this photograph right here is of Alexander T. Augusta. And I was working on an exhibition and one of the, one of the sections in the exhibition was about the uniform, which I've talked about. And uh, Augusta had some uh, experiences where people attacked him and ripped his major's oak leaves off his shoulders. And it was really important to find a, um, a photograph of him. And so I had found a line drawing that looked just like this photo in the public library in Toronto. And I said, wow, where'd they get this from? They had to have gotten it from some other image. And so I had to think outside the box. And I said to myself, who would have had a photograph of Augusta in uniform or not in uniform? And I said, well, his wife probably would have. And a lot of times we discount uh, the, the importance of women in these stories. So I started to do some research about her. I found out she was from Baltimore. And uh, two of her sisters were nuns in the Oblate Sisters of Providence convent, which was established in 1829. It's the first um, religious order of women of color. And she had two sisters that were nuns in that order. And so um, the, uh, Augusta, the Augustas did not have children. And after uh, Aug uh, Alexander died, she moved back to Baltimore and she went to live in the convent of the Oblate Sisters of Providence for the rest of her life. So I said, well, I wonder when she died, I bet she left her stuff to the Oblate Sisters of Providence. So I knew they had an archive and I called the archives and I said, um, I'm looking for this. And, they, and the, the archivist goes, you know, I think we have something like that. Um, because indeed, Mary Augusta left all her possessions to the convent. So that was a Friday. I made an appointment to go on Monday. I didn't sleep the whole weekend. Um, I showed up there, and what 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 I found was this image, a uh, small carte de visite of this, as well as one of uh, Anderson Abbott and Abraham Lincoln. So that was something quite amazing. Um, and just to answer your question about what I have found since, it also is a story about a photograph. Um, there's a story about a, a, a surgeon in here named Richard H. Green, um, and he was the only one to serve in the Navy, and his story is quite different and interesting, and um, there's a whole chapter about him in here. But um, I had finally found an image of him when he was a teacher at a school in Bennington, Vermont, and it came out of an autograph book of a student that was there. So that's the one that's in this book. But about a week after my manuscript had gone to the publisher for printing, I found another article in Yale's alumni newsletter, and they had tracked down one of his great-great-granddaughters who now, who still owns the house he lived in in the 1870s. And sure enough, there was an image of him in his Navy uniform. Well, I, if I had had that two weeks earlier, I would have told them, hold off, you can't print this without putting this photo in the book. So, you know, you're bound to find something new. Um, but there, there is a website for the uh, emerging civil war um, where I have a page there that they've allowed me to put additional information. And the book has a QR code that takes you there. And that story and that image is up on the web there. Great. Thank you for that. I'm going to um, uh, pass this, pass it over to Angela, before uh, we go to additional questions, I think. I also do see a bunch of questions in the chat, so I don't know. Oh, no, uh, for, for others to deliver questions. Yeah. OK. Yes. Yeah, we'll definitely answer all the questions. I know okay. sometimes it takes people a moment to 
think about their questions. So go ahead and put those in the Q&A and I'll just do a couple of housekeeping things before we get to the questions. Um, I wanted to draw everyone's attention to an exciting acquisition that the Clements Library made um, recently. It is the first American edition of Phyllis Wheatley Peters' uh, book of poetry, poems on various subjects, religious and moral. And it's currently on display uh, at the Clements Library. In addition, we've launched a crowdfunding campaign to raise $42,000 for acquiring this book. Um, purchasing historical materials uh, often requires us to move quickly and then think about how to raise the money to replenish the coffers afterwards. So I hope through crowdfunding that anyone in the world passionate about history can um, have a hand in our uh, acquiring of this amazing object. So I invite you then to see it on display in person at the Clements Library Monday through Friday from noon to four, or um, you can also take a look at the exhibit online and think a little bit about what resistance looked like in different settings and different forms when we think of it as um, resisting with arts. All right. And then next month, we'll be celebrating Women's History Month and Clements Associate Curator of Manuscripts, Jane Ptolemy will join uh, me for the bookworm to introduce us to influential 19th century activist, Emily Howland. Howland worked to advance abolition, African-American education, women's rights and suffrage, pac pacifism, and more. And yet, most of us haven't ever heard of her. So come explore her story and what the Clement staff have learned about her work and struggles while pre preparing a new and remarkable collection of her papers for public use. Uh, through letters, photographs, diary entries, and more, we will think about the impact of her work, her personal life and struggles, and how women have shaped our history in ways big and small through the centuries. And um, I want to thank Jim and Linda Wilson once again for sponsoring today's episode of The Bookworm. And if you're interested in sponsoring a future episode, you can reach out to me or to Ann Bennington Helper. All right, I see lots of questions. Um, I, I think uh, Tom's question is, is, you know, going back, you had mentioned um, uh, that, well, so I'll read his question. Was it common for Black families to have both free and enslaved members, and how would that work? And you talked about it a little bit, but it, it is sort of a complicated thing that perhaps we haven't thought about before. Yeah, I, I don't really know how common it was, but obviously it did exist. Um, and, it, you, you know, uh, what's interesting is, is that uh, it, it must have been an interesting dynamic because, say, for John Rapier Jr., he and his brother James were free, but they went and lived with their enslaved grandmother. Um, I can't imagine that they were treated any differently by the people there. I'm sure they were treated just as if they were enslaved, but obviously they weren't. And um, I, I think when I, I believe that the uh, whether you were enslaved or not was dependent upon your mother, because John Rapier's birth mother was a free woman um, and his father was free and therefore he was born free um, but then when his father remarried and she was not and she was enslaved then her children were considered enslaved what's interesting also is also um, I, and like I said I can't imagine that they're treating them any different I think they, white people were treating all black people the same, I, 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 you know, and especially the enslaved were even, um, I think, uh, treated even more poorly. Excuse me. But um, what's interesting also that, to go along with that, when I mentioned Chimborazo Hospital, 
in um, in in um, in uh, Richmond, and the fact that the black nurses were mostly enslaved. They have listings, and it says uh, Negroes had served in Chimborazo number seven, and it tells you whether they were enslaved or not, and who what. And what's interesting is that there were one or two people that were listed as free. So that must have been also a different dynamic. Here are these enslaved people working alongside uh, other nurses that were free. Um, so it, I, I can't imagine that it wasn't an unusual dynamic. Right. Um, uh, Zoe was wondering if you could put the quote about Al, um, Alpheus Tucker professorship back up. Let me go. I'll have to find the screen. I'm going to share my screen. And I do think that I have that. I just have to remember where it is. I think it's at the end. Uh, hold on. And I will. I believe that is the one that you're looking for. All right. Thank you. So we'll leave that up for a moment if uh okay. so zoe can take a look at that and then um while that's up i um mari has has a a good question that all uh historians and authors struggle with how do you decide which stories are central to your projects and which are support stories and um, mm. um that's interesting because you know when you're writing something like this all the stories are essential to your to your project um i think when you write a biography my goal here was to write a bi bi uh, a a, um, a a biographical treatment of these men so um you know so all their stories were central to the entire project but if you if you kind of narrow it down a little bit when you're writing each individual one you have to really look at the, the 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 entire story to figure out which parts of their stories are the most important and i think what i try to do is to use parts of their stories that showed their level of um uh, their level of commitment to uh the search for freedom um you know, there are different themes, pride and patriotism, justice and freedom that were part of this book. So I try to um, focus on those themes and to find the stories that best illustrated them. Um, and I think that really is um, how I kind of came about to determine that, you know, it, it it's difficult because you always get, when you're writing a book, you always get something that says, this has to be under a certain number of words. And it becomes difficult sometimes to cut out stories that you think are important. Right. Oh, definitely. Um, so there are two questions about what the difference at the time was between a surgeon and an MD, or if there was a difference yeah. or, or how that Work. Well, I, I think all of these men were medical doctors um, and medical doctors in the military are called surgeons. So um, but I do believe they they perform surgery. Um, I don't. You know, sometimes it's a definition. I think it was a little bit different then, because, for instance, medical education at that time, when they got their medical education, you could basically do an internship. Uh, with um, a, a, a seasoned physician for five years, six years, however more. And then you do this apprenticeship and then you can practice medicine. You didn't have to go and get a degree. You didn't have to have a license necessarily. Um, so medical education at the time was a little bit different. You also have to keep in mind that it was difficult to get into medical school for these men, even though many of them attended uh institutions that you'd be surprised, like Yale, Dartmouth, University of Michigan, um, Worcester Medical College, Maine Medical College. So um, they did attend medical schools. And I think for these men, they actually really needed to have medical degrees to even be considered for a position um, mm -hmm. in the army. So 
medical education was a little bit different at the time. And keep in mind also for black men that were going to medical school, they couldn't do any, they couldn't go to a hospital to get additional training because they didn't, they weren't accepted. And this is why in the late 1800s, like around 1890 or so, they actually created, organized, ran their own hospitals, black owned, black operated for black people because they couldn't get training. And most of them also were nursing uh, training nurses because there was nowhere for them to do that. And in some instances, like um, John Van Surly de Grasse, he came from a fairly wealthy family. He was able to go to Paris and study there and gain some more surgical skills. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Pamela goes on to think about this a little bit more because, you know, what a lot of us think about in terms of civil war surgery is amputations on the field. And so um, were those the kinds of problems that they were dealing with? Did they write about, you know, what what they were treating most? Well, it's first of all, there's not a lot of written uh, personal letters or notations made by these men. John Rapier Jr. was was unusual, but most of that was during his younger years. Um, Richard Green, who was in the Navy, actually Yale University acquired letters that he wrote during the Civil War while he was on a Navy ship, which is quite interesting. Um, but you find, I, I, I was able to find through various um, documents, uh, there's the um, the history of the Civil War medicine. It's like this multi-volume thing. It's this long name of the you know medical history of the War of the Rebellion. And they list every little case. And there are a few notations about William Powell and Anderson Abbott who were at Friedman's Hospital. And in one case, um, one of them performed an amputation. So they were doing those kinds of things. Um, whether they, the question of equal access in this question, I think I mentioned, um, I th definitely think their practices were hampered by discrimination in the sense that they couldn't get additional training. Um, in Washington, D.C., a lot of the white doctors went and took their patients away because, you know, they weren't members of this society. So there was lots of that. In the, the majority of these men treated black patients in black hospitals um, and in, in black communities. Um, so I, I hope that answered that question for you. Thank you, thanks. Um, Cheryl is wondering, because we did talk a little about appearance and and yes. you know who who you are and how you presented yourself. So she's wondering if you know how many of the men you wrote about identified as mixed race and if that um, affected their admission to the profession. Well, um, it's interesting that it says how many identify uh, how many of them identified as mixed race. I don't know whether I think all of these men identify themselves as black men in this and in, in even today, people that are of mixed heritage. Um, if one of their parents is black, it doesn't really matter what their other parent is. Everybody considers them to be black. So I think in the same instance here, but most of these men came from what I would consider well to do families that had some money. But they also came from, the majority of them came from mixed heritage. Um, William Powell's father was black, his mother was Native American. Um, Anderson Abbott definitely was, there was a mixture of white and um, um, African American. Same with John Rapier. Um, so many of them had European mix in, and so um, that may or may not have affected their admission. Um, I... I, I can't say for sure. Um, Cortland Van Rensselaer Creed was the first graduate of Yale Medical College. Um, and it's interesting to note that sometimes these schools did not identify their students by whether they were white or not. But clearly, John Rapier did, erect, did recognize it. And as we could see, for the admission at University of Michigan, how they identify themselves did affect their admission to school. Admission to the profession, I don't know. 
most people rejected black doctors to start with. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know, obviously that affected their, it affected three of these doctors from admission to a professional organization. So clearly that did affect them. Right. Um, let's see. I have to say these questions, I'm looking at all the questions as we go. Sure. All really very interesting questions. Um, and Zoe says that that it's okay to put the slide down if you'd like to. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, um, do you, Tom is asking if the medical students, if the black medical students, had difficulty obtaining housing. Well, that's kind of interesting. And from what I can tell, I didn't any of them. Uh, like John Rapier talks about living in and living wherever he was living and they went to school. Um, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to mention, I think someone asked a question about um, uh, why was the university of Iowa so accepting and Michigan right. was not. So it's kind of interesting because when you, when you look at some of these um, men, some of them mention um their living situations like John Rapier and uh, Richard Green, where they lived. I mean, Richard Green went to um, Yale as an undergraduate, so he lived in New Haven and was from New Haven. Whether they had difficulty finding housing, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it. I don't see any evidence of it, but it, it could be. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that there's one chapter in my book that is just, um, it's just about Iowa and the four doctors that went there, primarily the three doctors. It's called the Iowa Connection. Um, Alpheus Tucker, J.D. Harris, and Charles Taylor were the other three that went to this medical school in Iowa. And it is kind of interesting. That was a question I asked. How and why would four Black students be able to stay at a college in Iowa? Um, you can read more about it in my book. Um, to find out a little bit more. But uh, Keokuk was right on the river and it was a port and a lot of ships came in there with, uh, you know, there was a lot of trade. So we can say that maybe there was a little bit more tolerance and acceptance of differences. Um, but the medical school there also taught a class in military medicine that allowed students to qualify for the board for the medical board exam. And that may or may not have also been something of interest. So it's difficult to say, and I just hypothesized some about it here, but um, I also found it interesting that um, that uh, that particular school accepted four black students because there were, you know, Harvard had two black students at their medical school. And when Martin Delaney joined, that was three. And that, once the third student, it was too much and they were both, and they all three of them were asked to leave. Uh -huh. so. Interesting. Uh, well, I think that answers all of the questions, unless you or Cheney have any um, last thoughts that uh, this amazing discussion has brought up. Um, yeah, and did anybody else have any questions? I'm happy to answer them. Well, this has been an amazing morning. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and for the good questions. And um, so... Yeah, and uh, Helen did include the uh, link and the discount in the chat, and it will also be in the follow-up email. I saw a couple people asking um, about how to buy the book. So, yes. and um, the book is you can also get it on Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble. There's plenty of outlets that you can get it to if you use this code and you get it through the Southern Illinois University Press. There's a little discount, but you know Amazon always changes their prices, so it's possible that it's. Uh, at a reduced price, but it is available um, on Amazon, which is kind of a, a a place where lots of people go. I don't know what the price is. I'm going to look it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, um, yes, so this has been fantastic. And thank you so much, Jill. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your work with us. And um, yeah, this is 
been great. So everybody have a great weekend. Thank you. And it is a little bit cheaper on the uh, on uh, Amazon right now instead of 29, it's 26. But <laughs> if you have Prime, you'll probably get free shipping, right? Um, That's right. I, exactly. I, thank, thank you so much um, for the opportunity to speak. And thank you for all the great questions and for everybody that attended. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.